more close to us. Um, he has been a regular speaker at the Tibia Conference in the U.S. In fact, when he first started um, coming up here to give lectures, um, his son, Corey, was not yet in the world. And here, Corey, he's almost five years old now. And we have two very young guests today. One of them is Claire, who is about one year old. So we have, um, we're very honored to have them with us, too. And um, for those of you who were not lucky enough to catch Dr. Lee's previous lectures in our previous three translations of the Mark, you can go to the IITBT um, website and they are all there available. But tonight we're very happy to welcome him to give a talk and also tomorrow afternoon. Tonight's talk is focusing on Confucian era and Scoble's period, which I'm sure he will explain to us more what that is about. But I think it's very interesting for us to know as translators um, about the considerations of Scoble's period. And also tomorrow he's going to be talking about um, Avatamsaka Sutra, which is even more interesting. So we welcome Dr. Christine. Thank you. Thank you for your very generous introduction. Um, I was trying to remember for when I first started coming here and tying it to Corey's age, I guess, gives me a better idea. Now, um, thank, I'd like to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to come here and talk about my, my two most recent translation projects for um, another way to look at it, because these are perhaps just translation experiments that I'd like to share with everybody. Um, these are, there are three things that I'd like to talk on this trip, actually. One is my translation of the Confucian Amulets, which I just completed this summer. The other is my translation of the uh, Dhamma of the Bodhisattva Journey, which I completed and published last summer. And then at the very end of this, um, I'm also going to take a chance to look at three translations. So uh, these are the three things I'm going to focus on. Before I begin, though, I'd like to say that I'm not an expert in Buddhist studies. So whatever I say, please take it with a grain of salt, because I'm pretty sure that probably everybody here knows more about Buddhism than I do. Okay, so um, tonight I'm going to begin with uh, the topic that is probably the furthest from what you are doing, that is the, uh, my translation of the Amulets of Confucius. It's probably similar in that it's a uh, translation from classical Chinese into English, but other than that, you could say that the subject matter is pretty different. Uh, the way I'm going to do it is this. I'll start with a simple introduction. And then after that, I'd like to begin my talks with a little bit of theory. So um, in this case, I'm going to talk about Scopus theory, how it's related to translation action and translation behavior. And then I'm going to apply this approach to my um, translation of the Amulets. This includes how I deal with the genre, the people, the culture, uh, the quotations in the Amulets, the letter, and the syntax. And then at the very end, um, I'm going to end with a little feedback story about new discoveries that I hope you find interesting. Okay, a little introduction. Uh, let me just say at the outset that although my talk is titled Translating the Amulets of Confucius, what I really mean by this is how I translate the Amulets of Confucius. It's not meant to be how um, everybody else is supposed to translate the Amulets of Confucius. So this is meant to be a descriptive statement rather than a descriptive statement. I just want to make this clear at the outset. Now, um, let's put things into perspective first. One thing we might want to ask is, why do we need another translation of the Amulets of Confucius? Okay, as uh, John Minford once says, in the West, there has this, this word, Amulets of, uh, of Confucius, has been translated and retranslated literally dozens of times. I'm sure if you look in World Tech, you can probably find over perhaps 40 English translations of the Amulets of Confucius. So do we need another one? And why? Okay, um, so a quick look through the history of translations of the Amulets uh, into Western languages. The earliest is this work over here, uh, published in 1687. This was a translation into Latin uh, that was very popular in Europe. And one of the most popular early translations of the Amulets is the James Blake version, which you can find pretty easily on the internet. Um, this is another one. 
And then if you look at the ones that were published before the 19th century, um, there are at least five that are uh, cited pretty often. And when you look at the 20th century, um, here you have a list of 13 different Polish translations of the Elamites. And that's not even counting the ones that are published in Asia, in Greater China. So if you put that in, um, as I said, you could easily have over 40 English translations of the Elamites. So why do we print other ones? Uh, this is Arthur Wayne's translation into Victorian English. Um, some people think that looks more like the smoothest English translation of the Elamites. And this one is another take on it by the American poet Ezra Pound. Okay, so you get the idea. Why do we need another translation? Now, to answer this question, um, I want to clear a common misconception. One idea people often have is that when we're producing a translation, we're trying to produce a standard or authoritative translation. So on Google, if you search for translations of the Amorites, you often get this question, what is the best translation of the Amorites? And people assume that when you're translating it, this is what you are aiming for. Um, people also ask, if you're doing another translation, is your translation going to be better than the one that's going to be I can probably answer at the outset that the answer is no. I don't expect my translation to be better, but then why am I translating it? Let me answer it this way, uh, with three analogies. Uh, the other day, I saw my wife shopping on Amazon. She was shopping for a pair of jeans. And then so I was asking her, don't you already have 20 pairs of jeans? Why do you need another one? So the other day when I went to Home Depot to pick up a screwdriver, uh, she was asking me, don't you already have 20 screwdrivers? Why do you need another screwdriver? But to me, the nature of these two questions is different. In that when you look at jeans, to me at least, some uh, fashion experts might disagree, but jeans are basically replaceable. If you tear a pair of jeans, you can easily pick up another one and wear it. So they're replaceable in that sort of way. Whereas with screwdrivers, if I'm working with a screwdriver and it breaks, I just can't, I can't just pick up any other screwdriver and expect it to work the same way. Now, the reason I'm using this analogy is that to me, a translation is more like a screwdriver than a pair of jeans. Translations are not mutually swappable to me. If you look carefully at translations, you will see that each translation captures a certain aspect of the original. And it's only by putting all these different translations together that you get a better picture of what the original is trying to say. So one of the, another analogy that I've used before is that um, translation is like photography. If you imagine the source text as a 3D object that is three-dimensional, you can look at small size. The translation can only capture one aspect of it. Okay, if you look at this bust of um, Barack Obama, you can see that when we try to <laughs> photograph it, with each photograph, we capture a certain aspect, and yet we're losing all the other vantage points. And to me, a translation does the same thing. So what is my translation to? My answer is that I'm giving you a different vantage point that you probably can't get from um, the existing translation. That is the aim of what I'm trying to do here. A more technical way to look at this is um, if you think of map projections, in geology. Now, we all know that uh, most of us here believe that the Earth is round, right? If the Earth is round and uh, we're living on a sphere, a globe, when we look at a map, the map is something that is planar, two dimensional. So, very often when we're producing maps, we need a way to project this three, by three dimensional sphere onto a two dimensional surface. And there are different ways to do this. And with each mathematical projection, you preserve certain properties, but you lose other properties. For example, some uh, projections uh, preserve surface area, but then they lose the shortest route, or local shape, or distance. If you look at some examples, this is an equal area projection, so you get a pretty good sense of how big the different constant, the continents are, but then you lose a sense of direction. Whereas this one here, is an equal distance projection, but then you see that at the two poles, uh, the surface area is destroyed. And this one is kind of a uh, uh, compromise of sorts. So you sort of get the idea. And to me, um, a translation does the same thing. When you perform your translation, you need to ask yourself, 
what is it that I am trying to preserve and what is it that I am willing to give up? Sometimes you can't have it both ways. Okay, so to simply answer the question of why I'm doing this, um, to use analogy two, two, I'm trying to present the analects of Confucius from a different angle, one that hasn't been presented before. To use analogy three, I'm trying to provide a radically different map projection that preserves a different constant from existing maps. And after I show you um, how I do it, hopefully um, you'll get to see what I'm trying to do. Okay, now let's talk about the approach. The, pro the approach I'd like to introduce here is that of Scopel's theory. Uh, Scopel's comes from the Greek, it means purpose. So this is a theory of translation that focuses on the purpose. A question I often get um, in my translation classes is, in my first class I would always ask my students, why are you taking this class? What are you trying to do here? And the answer that I get the most often is, I would like to learn the standard or the correct way to translate it. Now, I think it's really the wrong way to look at it, the wrong question uh, when you ask what's the standard or correct way to translate, but I can probably think of two possible answers to this. The first is that you might be thinking, um, what is the socially acceptable way to translate? That is to say, what is everybody else doing? What are other translators doing? And I would like to learn to do things that way. But the problem is, if everybody's doing it that way, why do we even get another person to do it that way? So to me, the more interesting question is, when you translate, what is the target or the goal that you are trying to achieve? Um, can your translation achieve something that other translations cannot? What can the readers of your translation get out of it that they can't get out of reading other translations? And when you look at it this way, when you think of translation in terms of purpose or target, this is basically a scopus oriented approach to translation. So, um, so the way I'm going to look at it is when I approach translation, I'm hoping that my translation will achieve a certain target or goal. So translation is a tool for achieving the goal of understanding in the source text. And I do this with the understanding that each translation has a particular design geared at helping the reader understand a particular aspect of the source text, but also with the understanding that by taking this approach, um, the translation will have its strengths and its limitations. It will be good at certain things, and it will be not so good at certain things, kind of like how tools are in every case of life. Um, I want to take a quote from Noam Chomsky, the linguist, who says that any system with structure and design has its scopes and limits. If it had no intrinsic structure and design, it could do nothing. It would achieve nothing. It would be useless for anything. But if it has a certain structure, then it will be good for some things, but not other things. Think of a hammer. Because it's shaped that way, it's good for pounding nails into the wood, for example. But it's not good for other things. Whereas if it didn't have a shape, if it was just an amorphous block, then you can't do anything with it. Okay, so to apply this to translation, um, each approach to translation will achieve certain goals. Each approach to translation will fail to achieve certain goals. So there's no such thing as a perfect translation. The task of the translation, the translator then, is to choose what are the goals that you want to highlight, which are the goals you are willing to give up. Okay, so a little bit about Scopel's theory. Uh, Scopel's theory comes from the work of the German translation scholars Katharina Rice and Hans J. Vermeer. Um, it, I guess the most representative work is their book published in 1984 in German. This was translated into English in 2016 by Kristin Mann Nord, who also works in the same area. Now, Scopel's theory is sometimes also known as function-based translation theory, or theory of translation action or a theory that emphasizes translating behavior rather than translating meaning. I'll go a little more into that in the next slide. So Scopel's theory is a theory of translation action. What it means is that when you're translating, you have to foreground purpose and situation. You also have to emphasize the effect on the reader or audience. 
So when you're looking at the thing you're, you're going to translate, you always have to ask yourself, what effect does it have on the source language reader? Uh, how do I reproduce the same effect in the target language reader? And when I do that, I have to take into consideration the situation that uh, the source text is being used in. So each step that we translate is produced by someone, we'll call that the author, with an intended audience, we'll call that the reader, with a specific purpose in mind, and that is the scopus. It is part of an act of communication. Now, if we do not consider how to achieve this purpose with the intended audience in mind, then we are basically failing in our act of communication. So with this in mind, when we're translating, the thing that we're trying to produce is what uh, uh, Rice and Vermeer called a translatum. And what that means is it's an offer of information that it's, let me rephrase that. It's an offer of information for target language readers that imitates the offer of information for source language readers when they get the source text in the source language. Does that make sense? So you could kind of think of translation as a form of imitation. Now, Scopus theory also believes that translation action is sensitive to situation, and that situation includes the cultural background of both audiences, the setting of the source language communication, and the relationships between the interlocutors, things such as the social relationship and the psychological background. So translation action is something that is sensitive to text reception. It's something that is also sensitive to text feedback. Okay, culture is a very big, um, I guess it's a very big part of Scopus theory. So I'm gonna go into the cultural aspect a little more. But before we do that, we need to define what culture is, or we need to understand um, at least what Rice and Vermeer uh, see as culture. They give a definition in their book, and to them, culture is whatever one has to know, master, or feel in order to be able to judge whether a particular form of behavior shown by members of a community in their various roles conforms to the general expectations or not. Okay, so to kind of apply this to what you guys are doing, if you're translating a Buddhist sutra, uh, you have to go back thousands of years, imagine yourself being in that society. What is normal in that society? What are the norms? What are the expectations? And then think, how are those expectations different from your audience now? And how do you make the adjustment, not only in language, but also in cultural expectations? to achieve the same effect. Now, um, Rice and Vermeer introduce something they call cultural refractions. Um, in tomorrow's talk, I'll talk a little more about this. But today, what I want to do is to just give here five types of cultural refractions that they believe may affect um, the audience's interpretation of the text. These include culture-specific conventions, um, individual attitudes, different realities, frozen traditions, Value systems. Okay, really quickly, each of these. Cultural refractions, sorry, uh, culture specific conventions. In American society, if I talk about winter break, you automatically think of Christmas because winter break overlaps with Christmas, right? That's not always the case in other countries. So, what is natural, um, what automatically comes to mind in one culture, isn't necessarily the case in another culture. When we talk about Thanksgiving, you can look up Thanksgiving in the dictionary and know that it's a holiday that celebrates, uh, let's say, the Native Americans helping the pilgrims, but that's not all there is to it. When Thanksgiving comes to mind here, you also think of things like the fall and Black Friday, that things that might not be in the dictionary definition. Okay, these are uh, part of these culture specific conventions. Um, next, individual attitudes. Think about things like QR codes or mobile payment. In China, these are really common. These are almost the norm. Whereas over here, it's still, um, it's yet to catch on. So it seems, it, it's, it's something that is seen as more advanced. Uh, it's something for the uh, more tech savvy. Over here, people are very sensitive to race. When people talk about white, black skin color, this is something that people pay a lot of attention to. In other societies, maybe less so. Okay, so this is also something to take into consideration. Different realities. People who are Buddhist believe in things like karma, destiny. Whereas people who are Christian believe in original sin. That causes you to look at the world in a different way. 
And with these different worldviews in mind, you may also interpret things differently. Pros and traditions. Uh, people here think Friday the 13th is unlucky, right? Um, Chinese speakers think the number four is unlucky. Chinese speakers also don't like to give clocks as presents. Okay, so there's no real logic to this, but if you're part of this culture, this is something that is automatic. These are connotations that automatically come up, so uh, these are important too. And value systems. These are things that may change. I remember when I was growing up in the 1970s, if something was made in Japan, what that meant was it was really bad quality. If you want something good quality, you had to buy something that was made in the USA. In the 1980s and 1990s, that started to change. And now if you see something that's made in Japan, you mean something that is really good quality. Um, when you're a Communist Party member, some people may have negative connotations for this. Whereas at a certain period in China, this was treated as a positive thing. Not everybody could be a Communist Party member. So you have the same fact, but you have a different light shown on it because of these cultural refractions. You get the idea. Okay, now an example that is given by Rice and Vermeer in their book is, they say that travel guides that are originally written for non-German audiences may have to be rewritten, at least in part, for German readers because they are interested in different aspects of a country. Think of it this way. Um, if you have a really popular German guidebook, it probably appear, appeals to a German audience because it mentions things that all German people know, history that they studied in school, geography that they studied in school. If you translate everything into English, these things might not be familiar to an English reader, and therefore the popularity of this guidebook may be different. If you want it to achieve the same popularity, you may actually have to change the content of the guidebook. Um, one example I like to use to illustrate this, and I've used it in my um, previous talks, is this example from Chinese martial arts novels. Okay, um, this is an example from the martial arts novel of Jin Yong. In it, you have a description of a lady, Miss Mill, who is a well-educated young lady from a rich family. She is served by a clever maid and two servant women who carry a cat and a pot containing an orchid, which would wither at the smell of a male, and a white parrot, which can chant poems. She would ask her maid to burn different types of incense on different occasions, and she drinks oolong tea with rosebuds. She plays the qing instrument, and she has poetry from the Book of Songs. To an English reader, this is something that is very unusual. What a very special girl. <laughs> In this period, however, this is a very typical rich girl. So if you preserve all the referencing here, you would have the exact opposite effect on the target language audience as you would have on the source language audience. So the question here for the translator is, do you want to preserve the effect or do you want to preserve the reference? If you preserve the one, you need the other, and that is one of the difficult choices in translation. Okay, so that is going over my theoretical part really quickly. You kind of get my idea. Um, I'm going to be taking a scopus angle um, to shine a light on the analects. I'm going to be focusing on the purpose of what Confucius is saying in here. And then I'm going to be emphasizing the effect that what he says has on its readers. Let's now look at the materials in the analytics and how I'm going to do this. Um, first, let me begin with a mini survey. How many of you have read the Kiki Analects? Terrific, either in English or in Chinese. Very good. How many of you have read part of it, either in English or in Chinese? Okay. Is there anybody, how many of you have enjoyed what you read? Oh, okay. That is a very, very good proportion. I'm glad to see that. <laughs> it is somewhat different from my initial reaction to the analyze. I have to admit, I, I did not enjoy it. And I'll tell you a little later why that is. Um, but if there are people that did not enjoy it, you need to ask, why not? And what is it that makes it not so readily enjoyable. We also need to ask, did the original audience find the analytics interesting or uninteresting? And uh, if they found it interesting, but it isn't so in translation, 
then we would say that the fault lies with the translator and that there are certain effects that have been lost in the translation. And if that's the case, we then want to ask, how do we uh, allow these events to resurface? Okay, so some considerations here are the genre and the people in the analytics and the culture that's embedded within and the things that are quoted in the analytics and also the language, the meter, and the cohesion devices, um, the syntax, and um, actually ignore the last part that we're doing now. We're getting to the other sections. Let's begin with the genre. Now, um, going back to Scopus theory, remember that in Scopus theory, the goal of translation is to produce a translatum, which is a target language offer of information which imitates the source language offer of information. So the question here is then how do we categorize the source language offer of information in the analytics? What kind of text in it is it? Okay, or in the words of uh, translation theorists such as Susan Bassman, Bassman and Andrew Lefebvre, we could ask um, what kind of textual grid does this text belong to? And what kind of textual grid do we want to put our translation into in the target language? Okay, if you look at the analytics, about 60% of it is monologue. The way I get at 60% is I count the different sections, and uh, for each section, if it's a monologue, I count one. If it's a dialogue, I move one to dialogue. And if it's narration and description, it goes in that category. So when you do it this way, about 60% of the different sections is just Confucius himself speaking, or another disciple speaking. And then you have another 30% that's dialogue. And then um, you have a small percentage, about 10%, 9%, which is narration. Okay, now what kind of textual grid would this fit into in English? Uh, what kind of text would be like this? Now, when you think of dialogue, um, some things that come to mind would be, well, actually, let's look at some, ex some examples first. So what kind of monologues do we have in, in the analytics? This would be an example. My master said, at 15, I set my heart on learning. At 30, I had planted my feet firm on the ground. At 40, I no longer suffered from perplexities. At 50, I knew what the biddings, I knew what were the biddings of heaven. At 60, I heard from where the docile hear. At 70, I could follow the dictates of my own heart. But what I desired no longer overstepped the boundaries of that right. Okay, this is from the Arthur Wade translation. This is Confucius talking about what he did at different stages of his life. This is a monologue. An example of a dialogue. Somebody said to Confucius, to repay hatred with kindness, what do you think of that? And then Confucius replied, and what will you repay kindness with? Rather, repay hatred with justice and kindness with kindness. Okay, this is from the Simon Lee's translation of Analytics 1426. This is an example of dialogue. And then occasionally you get some narration. For example, my master did not speak of freaks of nature, feats of strength, disorders, or spirits. Okay, this is from the more literal Books and Books translation of 1998. This is now at 721. Okay, so when you have a work with a lot of monologue and dialogue, what kind of category would it fall into in the Western tradition or English tradition? Some things that might come to mind are philosophical dialogues like those of Plato. A lot of people describe Confucius as a philosopher, so you might want to um, equate him with a Western philosopher like Plato and um, his works. Or you might think of theatrical scripts, maybe Shakespeare's plays. Or you might think of something more modern, like a chat log or um, <laughs> an instant messaging feed. Let's look at each of these and see the most. I was thinking that uh, a, an autobiographical work will also have similar break, breakdown, right? 60% mm -hmm. monologue, 30% maybe dialogue with other people, and about 10% okay. of, of uh, narration situation. I never thought of it, but that's a good idea. Would it have more narration if it's an autobiography? I don't know. If they're, they want to talk about their, not just their yeah. life, but their thoughts. Okay, cool. Yeah. That would be a very interesting yeah, other angle to approach it from. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, let's look at um, the philosophical dialogue and see if there are any similarities between the analytics and, let's say, Plato. So, 
So I've taken this um, dialogue from Plato's Catalyst, and I'm going to use this again for another reason. But uh, so let's take a look at it. Socrates says, "Will a man speak correctly who speaks as he pleases? Will not the successful speaker rather be he who speaks in the natural way of speaking and as things ought to be spoken, and with the natural instrument? Any other mode of speaking will result in error and failure." This is a discussion about whether the names are linked with the things that they represent, that is to say it's not arbitrary, or if in different languages, different sounds are arbitrarily associated with different things. So here Hermogenes says, I quite agree with you, Socrates, and is not naming a part of speaking, for in giving names, men speak. Hermogenes, that is true. And if speaking is a sort of action and has a relation to acts, is not naming also a sort of action? Hermogenes, true. Now we saw that actions were not relative to ourselves, but had a special nature of their own. Precisely. Then the argument would lead us to infer that names ought to be given according to a natural process and with a proper instrument, and not at our pleasure, and in this and no other way shall we name with success. I agree. So you can see here that Socrates is making an argument, and with each point that he brings out, he gives us a piece of that argument. When you put everything together, linked with logic, you have a more complex argument, arguing his case. That is rarely the case when he allies. Um, Confucius doesn't give complex arguments of this sort. And the dialect blocks that we see are basically something, somebody asking Confucius something, Confucius giving a long answer, and the other person not saying a lot. So, because of this difference. <laughs> okay. Uh, Eugene Chernoyan says, there appears to be no coherence, no logical development, no reason presentation of a point of view in the analects. Or to quote Yumikon, the analects in itself gives us no well-rounded view of the Confucian system of thought, except by some very hard thinking on the part of the reader. Um, I personally think it's very different from the dialogues you find um, in Plato. Could it be more like a theatrical, theatrical script? We look at uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, Juliet says, how kings thou hither, tell me, and wherefore, the orchard walls are high and hard to climb, and the place step, considering who thou art, if any of my kinsmen find thee here. Romeo says, with love's like wings did I hold approach these walls, where stony limits cannot hold love out, and what love can do that there is love attempt, therefore thy kinsmen find no spot to me. If they do see thee, they will murder thee, black and white, <laughs> or bear thine eyes, and plenty of their swords. Look. Uh, thou but sweet, and I am proof of your enmity. So you get the idea. So it's back and forth, there's banter, and it's actually leading somewhere. The dialogues that you find in Confucius tend not to lead anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, to quote Eugene Chernobyl again, the Lunar is nothing so much as a collection of unprepossessing, if profoundly insightful, anecdotes and intuitive remarks on various subjects arranged in no particularly conspicuous order, and governed by no discernible coherence. In other words, what is it? It's basically Confucius saying this and that, and the this and the that aren't really related to each other in any logical way. So that brings us to our third analogy. Could it be something like a chat log or a uh, tweet? Something like Donald Trump's <laughs> post. Why would Kim Jong Un insult me by calling me old when I would never call him short and fat? Oh well, I try so hard to be his friend, and maybe someday that will happen. I think a lot of the Alex is actually a lot like this. Um, one major difference is that you can actually understand what Donald Trump is saying here. The things that are being referenced that are being referenced by Confucius in the Alex, a lot of it you have no idea what it is. So if Donald Trump were to say something like this, Arakshi Yuniriksha Kujrai, who headed the this and that probe, text that to his this person in the BJP report that will stop this person from becoming this, doesn't get any lower than that. Okay. It is full of names and references to history that you don't get, which is one of the reasons why I think it is very difficult to penetrate. I understood it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> I know those guys. <laughs> They're notorious. Yeah, I I didn't realize there would be an expert here. <laughs> 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 so 
Okay, so to prove it, let's look at these passages from the Amorites. Okay, Shem Chose had killed Jim Cohen. Confucius faith then went to court. He reported to Michael, Cho Huan has killed the ruler. I asked for permission. The prince said, report it to the three masters. Okay, what just happened here? Somebody killed somebody, Confucius reported it, the other guy said report it to somebody else. But you have no idea who got killed, uh, who he's reporting it to, and who he's supposed to be reporting it to, right? Okay, another one. Shu Sun Wu Shu talking with the great officers at court said, Zi Gong is worthier than Zhou Ni. Zi Gong Ji Wu reported this to Zi Gong. Zi Gong said, I would compare it to the wall of the mansion and then he goes on to give some example. And again, a lot of people appear in here and um, it's not very clear what the relationship between these people are. So because of this, it's hard to understand their authority. The Zhou Ni in here is actually Confucius, but it's not clear from the they're phrasing it. Okay, so <laughs> this is the format that I am going with um, in my translation. I am pretty much turning everything into a tweet or what something, uh, or something that looks like a tweet. And I have some other reasons for it, which I will explain a little later. But before that, let's now go and talk about the people in the Amorites. Okay, in this section, I want to talk a little bit about the number of people in the Amorites, the types of people, and um, how they, how I am treating them, the names of the disciples, how I'm treating the effects of foreignness, semantic transparency, regional flavor, and status particles, and also um, the celebrities and politicians that are mentioned, and also the historical and mythical characters. Okay, let's consider the number of people. Uh, first, the length of the Amalekites is about 14,000 words, that is about 15 or 16,000 Chinese characters converted to words, if you give it that uh, 14,000. And the number of people mentioned in it are about 150. The people that actually speak number 62, but the speakers also mention other people. So you have to know about 152 people in order to understand the full Amalekites. Now compare that to the number of people you see in other works. Uh, the Analects is about the same length as Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is also uh, around 16,000 words, but you only have uh, 51 people. That's only a third of what you get in the Analects. A streetcar named Desire, um, almost twice the length, and you have only nine people. Okay, uh, the modern sitcom, like the Okay, um, 33 or 3,400 words, and you get, a, you get about nine people in there. So in most of the modern words that we're dealing with, we don't have to deal with a lot of people. And because of that, we're very familiar with the people that appear. The Amalekites would appear to us like a work with a lot of people that we don't know. So um, to quote the translation scholar Sharon Mai, what she finds often in translations of Chinese literature is that you get a crowd of characters jostling around in the story without distinct personalities. So it's very hard to follow it's very hard to understand who's who and what is happening in the work. So what do we do? Now, there's another issue that's related to this. I also want to consider the type of people that you get in the Amorites. The Amorites is mainly about Confucius, who does most of the talking, so he forms the core. And then in the second circle, you have the disciples, or the prodigies of Confucius. They do a bit of talking, too. And then you have Confucius's contemporaries. A lot of these are politicians, uh, political figures, or other celebrities of the day. And then you have the people that are mentioned, which are also the celebrities and political figures, but also historical figures and mythical figures. And to get a full understanding of the elements, you kind of have to know about all of these people. Now, when you consider what Confucius was doing, when Confucius was saying all of these things, his audience knew all of, all of these people. And because they knew these people, it made his language lively. He was able to refer to people that they knew for illustration. And when you use a living example, rather than something abstract, um, your message comes across more readily. But you have the exact opposite effect when you're speaking to a modern audience. The modern reader doesn't know any of these people. And when you have so many people that you don't know in a text, it makes it extremely confusing and disorienting for the modern reader. 
Let's look at some examples. Okay, I'm sorry I used Indian names again, so you probably know all the people. But um, if you were to read something like this, throughout history, many Abhinet uh, have moved into country managing. Think of the Pahalaban, Dal Tamulaka, who served as Gramani of Pravintisha, and Kutavaraman, who was two times Gramani of Shamar Sobhiva. Okay, um, I won't even attempt to read the whole thing. <laughs> to me, at least, to somebody who's reading this in English, it comes across like something like this. Throughout the unknown word has moved into country managing. Think of unknown word long name who served as unknown word long name. And long name was two times a word of long name. And when you get a few of these, everything becomes muddled up. When you don't get too many, you might be able to work out the logical relationship between uh, some of these. But at some point, the whole system is going to fall apart. Now, let me change this to something that you're actually familiar with, uh, into people that you might be familiar with. Throughout history, many celebrities have moved into politics. Think of wrestler Jesse Ventura, who served as governor of Minnesota. Bill Arnold Schwarzenegger, two-time governor of California. <laughs> President Ronald Reagan was a Hollywood movie star who made it to the presidency after serving for two terms as California governor. We all have to assume that everybody would know what California is, what Hollywood is, what Minnesota is, and Jesse Ventura, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Ronald Reagan. 2,000 years from now, that might not be the case. So it makes a huge difference whether the examples we're giving are people and places you know, or if it's something that you don't know anything about. And that, I think, is one of the problems with the references in the analyze. These are all people you don't know. Then you can change it to people that you do know. OK. Um, we're going to begin by doing something to the names of the people that appear in the analyze. So a little bit about the names of the people in the analytes. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that the naming system they use then is different from the naming system we use now. Uh, nowadays, you think of people as having a first name and a last name. This is true for English. This is true also for Chinese. A given name is given to you unique to you, whereas the last name is something that you get from your family. Now, back then, it was very different. OK, um, the system that you had back then is probably more like the system that you have with the British royal family. Uh, does everybody know who this is? Who's that? That's Prince Harry. What's Prince Harry's last name? <laughs> does he have a last name? I, I don't think they actually do. Because under the ancient system, what happens is you have what is like a Chinese clan name. In ancient China, um, if you were an ordinary person, you just had a given name. You don't have a last name. In fact, you're lucky even to have a given name. Sometimes you don't even have a nickname. Um, <laughs> if you're important enough, you have a lineage name and a clan name. The lineage is the uh, important family that you come from. And the clan is the land that you're ruling over or the ruling class that you belong to. So in the case of Prince Harry, uh, he would be Prince of Wales. So when he went to the army, if you look at his name tag, it says Harry Wales. That's the area that he'll be ruling over. That's the clan name. OK, the ancient Chinese billing system worked a little bit like that. But I'm not going to dwell on this too much, because um, in the analytics, most of the time, you're going to be dealing with the other two names, the given name and the silent name. The given name is kind of like the first name that we have now, given to you at birth. But in ancient China, when you reach age 20, when you mature, you're given another name called the Zi, the style name or the courtesy name. So most people in there have two names. And these two names are actually related in most cases. OK, to give an example, Confucius's son um, has the given name Li, which means cart. When he reached 20, he got a style name. Uh, his style name was Bo Yu. Yu meant fish. So carp is a fish, right? So it makes sense that he would have a courtesy name that is a superordinate category for his given name, which is carp. And the other character before the fish, that just means that he was the firstborn. That's a firstborn particle. So there are two things that are important here. Uh, the first is that the given name and the style name are related. 
The second important thing is that there is actually an image that you can see that's related to each name. Now, this is important because when you're reading the amulets in an Asian language, such as Chinese or Japanese or Korean Hanja, let's say, you see this image. Whereas when it's translated into English, okay, this name becomes Oyi or Ni, and that image vanishes. Without an image, it's harder to track or to follow each person. Okay, another example. Confucius has an important disciple, uh, Zen Zi. Zen Shen, or some people would say it should be pronounced Zen Tan. Shen or Tan is a war horse. And when he reached 20, he got the style name Zi Yu. Yu meant chariot. Okay, a horse, but also chariot, right? So the two are, again, related. But once you transliterate it into English, the romanization, you don't see that relationship anymore. Now, when you consider it this way, there are also some other issues that you might want to think about, which is the degree of transparency. I gave you two examples, which are of names that are very transparent. Not all names are like that. Um, you can have names such as Boyi, which is trans which is fully transparent to the modern reader. Then you have names such as that of Confucius's big disciple Yin Wei, which, if the modern Chinese reader sees the word Wei, what they think of is to come back which is different from the meaning back then, which is a whirlpool. So it's transparent, but in a different way. And then you have something like the name Yin Yin, which the modern Chinese reader has no idea what it means. It was supposed to mean like a flag group back then. So if you want to, or if our purpose is to approximate that effect, you would want to ask, are we trying to approximate the effect on the original audience, or are we trying to approximate the effect on the modern audience? In which case, you want to have to choose um, more opinions. Okay, now in existing translations of the analects, um, what people tend to do is to transliterate all of these names. They tend to use only one name, and when that is done, there is loss of imagery and there is loss of association between the uh, given name and the style name. So names come out as Boyu, Zidok, Ramo, Si. And these are imageless, they tend to be confusing. Now, what I will do, since I am using a chat format, a tweet format, right? Um, instead of using a name, I'm going to give everybody a handle. And what I can do with this handle is I can build imagery into it, as well as preserve the sound. So, for example, with something like Woody, I would. Uh, translate that into, let's say, gill as fishborn, to give you that fish imagery. So gall, gall, which has a lamb image, would become gar at lamb. Lamb would be the lamb image, and gar approximates the sound gall. Something like lam wood si, which has the mu imagery, would become slam at woodstock. I'll say a little bit more about that later. There are also instances where you can use both the sound and the image. Which has the imagery of attrition becomes basin that withers. Tiao, or Tiao Kai becomes trap and harvest. You get the idea. Um, and when you do this, you can have different degrees of transparency. Okay, dark at lamb, basin that withers would have full semantic transparency, um, and also some approximation in sound. Then with something like Boyi, well, you get the fish imagery, but you don't have the sound similarities anymore. And then with example number three, Yuma Shu becoming Omar Shagil, or Zitim becoming Ephraim <laughs> Uh You have some sound approximation, but um, the image, the image uh, transparency is not as um, apparent. Okay, I use Chayil because that is, I think, I think Hebrew or Yiddish for voice. And then um, Ephra is the same for word. So the meaning is there, but not readily uh, transparent. And then you have like Edward Johnson, the Dungeon Sith, which you have only a sound approximation and no imagery. Okay, so people might be asking here uh, by doing this, you are removing all traces of Chinese from the names. Is that a good thing? And this is something that has been explored before. Okay, um, in the work of Sawyer Florin, he once wrote that if you strip a cowboy of his traditional garb and attire him in the noose of a Sagai shepherd, 
he will lose all his natural resemblance and turn into an Arab. If we make a Nisha change her loose and airy kimono for a Nerobian journey doll with a close fitting bodice, there will be nothing Japanese left of her. Is this, is this something to be desired? My answer is that the answer depends on the ecology of existing translations of a given work, which is to say, if this is the only translation of the Amorites available, maybe you could argue that that's not something you want to do. If there are already 40 translations of the Amorites existing using a different approach, then it might be worth trying this approach to give you a different angle on it. Um, so, when we produce a scope centric Amorites, um, I'm going to quote Gaston here. The refusal, to, the refusal to adapt confines the reader to an artificial view of foreignness. To look at it another way, when you're dealing with a, when you're dealing with Chinese names, there are two ways to look at it. Do we want our characters to sound Chinese or do we want them to sound Western? If you take an absolutist approach, then of course Confucius is Chinese, so of course we want his name to sound Chinese. That's if you believe that he should be Chinese regardless of what language he is being translated into. If you take a relativist approach, however, when you're reading Confucius in the source language, he does not sound foreign. If you give him a Chinese name and translate him into English, then in the English translation, he will sound foreign. So in this sense, you're doing something different from what the source language reader is getting out of it. So um, what I've chosen to do here is I've chosen to adopt the relativist approach to make him sound not Chinese, uh, but at the same time not so foreign. And the advantage of that is that it becomes more user friendly, it better preserves imagery, and it aids in comprehension. Okay, how are we doing for time so far? I don't really keep track. Okay, do you have the, does anybody have the time? Okay, we have another 15 minutes. Good. Okay, and there are actually other things I want to do with names. It's not just making them into um, Twitter handles. Um, Confucius's disciples come from different states during the uh, during the Eastern Zhou. Okay, Confucius himself came from the state of Wu, and the north of it is the state of Qi. But he also trampled to states such as Wei and Song and Zheng and Chen and Tai. And then some of his disciples came from these other areas. So what I also wanted to do is to give each of the names a little bit of regional flavor to show where they're from. Now, the Wu and Xi are very similar. They're both in present-day Shandong, and according to accounts of the time, uh, there weren't that many differences in the language of these two places. So I basically made the names from these two states sound like uh, people, English names. So no marker of foreignness. Now, disciples from Seoul, I wanted to distinguish them a little bit from the people from Xi or Lu. So I gave them some markers. Uh, Sima Han, who is from Seoul, became Seymour at midnight. Yuan Xian, who is from Seoul, became Shen. <laughs> Shane at Lake Yuen. Okay, <laughs> the thinking is this. Shane, of course, is Xian, and Yuen, of course, is Yuan, but the mech at the beginning gives it more of a Celtic flavor, either Scottish or Irish, yeah. to show that they're from a different place. The disciples from Awake, okay, uh, <laughs> becomes August, then Marshan, okay, Wei Gongsun Chao becomes Gaspar Martin at Le Comte. Okay, the Le is there to make to give it a bit of a French flavor to show that they're from a different place. <laughs> okay, and then disciples from Chen, which is further south. Um, these we looked at before, from Marsha Yong, and from Viskin. These are basically Jewish type names. And then we have one disciple from Wu. Okay, uh, I've given him the name Yenianopolis for Yen Yen to give it more of a Greek flavor. Okay. <laughs> And there's one. In a lot of the uh, Xi, the courtesy names, there are particles that mean things. Okay, Confucius is known as Hong Xi. And people with the Xi suffix tend to be teachers of sorts. They tend to have their own disciples. So I wanted to make this show. So what I did was I used the word says. Confucius becomes Confucius at Master says, 
and that sort of distinguishes him as somebody who sits against his disciples. Other than Confucius, um, other disciples with us include Tenzin. He was a So Tenzin becomes Jonathan and Jomo says, he was becomes he where he says, Tenzin becomes the man that man says. That way you can distinguish these more, I guess, distinguished disciples from the others. Now, Brooks and Brooks, in their um, book on the Amalekites, also mentioned that a lot of these disciples have what is called the aristocratic particles. This is a so that comes before the name rather than after. After it's the sign of a teacher, before it's a sign that they are of aristocratic or noble origin. Okay, you have this in Zhu, Zhang, Zhang, but you never get it in Yanwei, or Yichang, or Nanyue. Okay, so what do I do with this? I played around with the French key particle, the German line, the Dutch fan, but it was impossible to do this while doing all these other things. So this is something that I eventually gave up on. Uh, it didn't work anyway, but I tried. Okay, so you get the idea of uh, what we're doing with names. And we spent a lot of time on names because names were very important to Confucius. He is uh, quoted for this particular saying, he is a uh, what is it is that um, when one of his disciples asked him, if you were put in charge of this nation, what's the first thing that you would do? And he said, if something has to be put first, it is perhaps the rectification, that rectification of names. It's kind of similar to what we had in Plato's Patterns that I quoted earlier, where um, you have the debate between a naturalist versus a conventionalist. It's a view that believes that certain things need to be named a certain way in order for it to be proper rather than to have arbitrary names. Okay, so to give a quick recap, and then I'll give some examples of how it actually works. Um, what I've been doing with the translation of names of disciples in the Amalekites is I am rejecting the translation, transliteration-based image-reducing approach and instead using chat handles that better give you uh, the image of the name. In some ways, it would sound more natural in English. It would allow the reader in English to form a mental image of the name. I would be able to preserve certain regional flavors, certain flavors of foreignness or lack thereof, and certain status bubbles. The desired effect is you get more vivid imagery. You would hopefully get more memorable characters. You would get a reduction of foreignness, and you would get a richer and more layered or textured reading experience. Let's see if that's the case. Okay, example number one. This comes from Amalek 11.03. The traditional treatment would look like this. Virtuous conduct, Jing Yuan, Ming Zi Tian, Yang Wo Niu, Zhong Gong, language, Zai Wo, Zi Gong, administration, Ren Yu, Ji Lu, and then culture, Zi Yu, Zi Xia. It's basically a list of names of disciples who are good in certain areas. Let's make it more natural. What an impressive lineup we have here. A wood Roman and Red King Mason with the strength of character, while Butch and Sly have mastered the art of persuasion. August and Yanni dandle us with their literary prowess, while Randall and Louis are born to be leaders among men. Okay, does it work? Okay, let's try another one. Ming Zetian was attending the master, standing at his side in a straight and correct manner. Also attending Ward Zilu, looking bold and uncompromising, and Ren Xiu and Zilu, both of them appeared happy and at ease. The master was pleased, but remarked, someone like Zilu will not get to live out his years. Okay, if we change the names, we get Confucius is served by Mason, who is respectful beyond reproach, and Louis, who is headstrong and fearless, and then there are Randall and Sly, who are very natural. Confucius, the master says, I like something I'd like to feel about their natural <laughs> Okay, so you kind of get an idea of what I'm trying to aim at with these names. Let's see if I have another example. Um, let's see. Okay, um, I guess we, I could stop here and take questions, or I could go on and talk about some other things. Uh, we'll make that better for people. <laughs> okay, let's we'll talk about celebrity. Okay, so now we're going to talk about disciples, what I do with the names of disciples, and I didn't do much. I basically just, instead of using transliteration to keep them sound, 
a way for imagery and gave them Twitter handles. I'm going to give Twitter handles to everybody, but um, with the celebrities, I'm going to do a little bit more. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Okay. Now, the thing about celebrities is when you have a source language in time space A and you have a target language in time space B, the more use of contemporary celebrities, examples in time space, from time space A, the more comprehensible the text is for the readers from that particular time space. But it has the opposite effect for your audience readers from a different time space, time space B. So what do we do with a text that's full of celebrities from time space A that readers from time space B are not familiar with? That is our question. Um, and again, I think we've looked at this example here uh, earlier. If you know the celebrities, it makes perfect sense. You can picture everything. If you don't, then it becomes a bunch of mumble jumble that you don't know um, what the text is talking about. Okay, now keeping in mind that in Scopus theory, what we're doing is producing a translatum, an offer of information about the equivalent effect. What we want to do in this case is to replace the celebrities from time space A with celebrities from time space B that have the same function, that produce the same effect. And this is what I also try to do in this translation. Um, before I go there, a little bit about uh, the, the royalty. Um, so Confucius, Confu Confucius converses with certain political figures and the ruling class back in his day. And his was a system where China was ruled by what is a Tianzi. Some people call this a king, some people call it an emperor. Uh, this is the representative of the Zhou dynasty. But underneath the Zhou emperor or king, there are these different rulers of different states, like Lu Guqi. They're sometimes translated as dukes. They're sometimes translated as kings. So if you take the Zhou ruler to be an emperor, then the rulers of Lu Guqi become kings. If you take the Zhou ruler to be a king, then the rulers of Lu Guqi become dukes. I opted for the second approach because for the modern reader, it's a little bit easier to understand the notion of a king than it is for them to understand the notion of a duke. And most of the time, you're dealing with readers from this class. However, even if you were to talk about the king of Wu, the king of Xi, these are people that are not going to be familiar to the English language reader. So you're not going to have a mental image in your head other than the fact, the fact that he is a king. So to give them a little more personality, I've switched them for, um, for rulers, characters from European history. So Qi Jingong becomes Louis XIV, the second king. Uh, Lu Bingong becomes King Frederick. Uh, Lu Aigong becomes, in different contexts, and in different contexts, I use different figures. We have one context where he becomes President Obama. Uh, Wei Lingong becomes either Napoleon or I am uh, terrified. And you'll get a sense of it when you see the actual examples and see how it works um, in these examples. Let's look at this example from Analytics 15.01. Okay, in a traditional translation, you have Du Ling Wei ask Confucius about military formations. Confucius answered, I have indeed heard something about the use of sacrificial vessels, but I have never studied the matter of commanding troops. And the next day, he departed. Now, the assumption here is that Du Ling Wei was more concerned with military matters than he is with morality. And that is not Confucius's view of things. So they don't see things the same way. And because of that, uh, he leaves. In my translation, Napoleon asked Confucius about the period of the war. And Confucius answers, you know, the Shakespearean theater I may know a little about, but the military theaters are not my thing. And then he packs up and leaves the next day. The reason I do this is because when you look at the original text, there is no connection between sacrificial vessels and the matter of commanding troops. We need to build some sort of connection there in order for this answer to work. And so the use of theater in two different contexts is what I work with over there. OK, this example we looked at before. Uh, Chen Chengzi had killed uh, Zheng Gong. Confucius bathed and went to court. He reported to Ai Gong, 
uh, Carol Fine has built the ruler, I asked to punish him. The prince then reported to the three masters. Confucius said, as I follow after the great dignitaries, I did not dare to report how my sovereign says to report to the three masters. He went to the three masters and reported, but was not given permission. To understand this, you need to have, you need to return to, to the idea of culture. What is considered normal in this time? When you have a situation like this, uh, what is considered the normal thing to do? And it's only when you understand what the normal thing to do is that you see what Confucius is trying to do is the normal thing, but he isn't succeeding at that. So um, I had to convert this into a modern scenario uh, that people would understand, and also a system that people would understand and would see as normal. Okay, and this is what it is. Russia annexes the Crimea. Confucius sits up and heads to the White House to request action. Obama says, go ask Congress for authorization. Uh, Confucius says, okay, but I just want you to know that as a political advisor, I have the obligation to tell you what I believe to be the best course of action. Confucius then presents his case to the House and the Senate, which both say no. So in the original context, what happens is Confucius reports to the ruler of the state, which is the ruler of the ruler. But the ruler of Wu at the time did not have that much power. Uh, the wealth and the power of that state was in the few families, which I'll talk a little more about later. So when Confucius goes to the ruler, the ruler says, I don't have the power. You have to go in and see these families, which is what Confucius does. But in the end, they decided not to pursue what Confucius thought was the right thing to do. And hopefully by using this example, I've given, him, given you an example of what seems like the right thing to do and a um, delegation of responsibility to a different um, body, and that body um, not giving Confucius the permission to do what he wants to do. And this might be a good place to stop. When we come back tomorrow, I want to continue and talk about, um, we talked about contemporary celebrities. Tomorrow we'll continue with historical figures and mythical figures, and then I'll talk about the culture, I'll also talk about uh, metrical devices and syntax, and then I'll finish with um, a little story about the digital version of the Okay, if people have any questions. Yeah. And that is a very good question. I think uh, there would be a lot of people that think this might be putting too much creativity into it. And it's something I would not do if there were not other translations of the novels already out there. Um, but because there are already a lot of translations that seem to translate using the traditional method, I wanted to present a different angle. Um, and I want to emphasize that this is not to replace the traditional translations, but to supplement them in a way. And tomorrow, as I talk about the evolution of translation theory from the 1960s to the present day, you'll see the gradual move from the traditional emphasis on translation of language, meaning equivalence, to the approach that you have today, which emphasizes more the transposition of culture, how you uh, move from one culture to the next, and how when you're translating, uh, the culture itself needs to be changed. So in a way, I would like to believe that this is an approach that is more consistent with the, I guess you could say, modern approach to translation theory. But critics of this approach would also say that the modern approach to translation theory isn't so much focused on translation anymore. It's something that is more like cultural studies or uh, linguistic. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've been asked, I've also been asked that before, and um, there isn't a formula that I use for matching the one with the other. I basically look for similarities, and the more similarities I can find with them, 
uh, the better candidate I think the one is to replace the other. Now um, you have to be familiar with both sets of issues, yes. But what I'm hoping is that for a target language audience, which might be more familiar with the latter set than the former set, this might be helpful. Um, a reader in English might know nothing about Xi Jinping or uh, Liu Aigong, and they might know something about, let's say, uh, Napoleon or the Sunken. In that case, you're giving them some sort of imagery rather than uh, asking them to start from scratch. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely consider that. And one thing I didn't get to mention was that um, in my translation, where I depart from the, the original people, I actually give importance to the original people now. So for people that are interested in, in um, if you don't think it's really a one, then if you should start to, in the footnote, you will see who it was that he spoke to. <laughs> and the question is, uh, in doing it, do you already have a target audience that you're thinking of? Okay, these are the people who's going to read and have a lot of fun reading this version of translation. Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, um, I was aiming this at people, not an academic audience, not a uh, captive audience who are already determined to study Confucius or the analects. I was aiming at a um, audience who is not familiar with the analects and who are not willing to put in the time to study the history or no background in this either to understand the, the analysis. That is what I was aiming for. Another thing that I was aiming for was, um, when you think about it, the analysis itself is not a very long text. I was hoping that by doing it this way, you could read the analysis from start to finish in about two hours. If you had to look up each reference, that's going to take a long time, and that's probably going to be long enough. But I was hoping that with this approach, um, you can read everything and get straight to the core moral message of Confucius. Yeah, there's a comment that you know, the way that quote tells us Indian mythological characters and uh, contemporary political figures is incomprehensible to most of you. Mm -hmm. Most of the Chinese texts that you showed were mm -hmm. translated in English, it's like that for me. Mm -hmm. yes. So, but I'm interested in knowing about Confucius' work, and I was making a mental note, I'm going to go read your translation, because that's, <laughs> the, that's the only one that's going to make sense, give me a sense of the philosophy of what he was trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, I didn't really care about a certain period in, mm -hmm. in knowing all the historical reference, so I would be a natural marker. Yeah, I mean, you're not the only one. When I first read Confucius, it was like that for me, too. I had no idea who these people are, and uh, it came to fit my reading. Yeah, thank you. Master, yes. since you came from the media uh, background, and uh, I would like to ask, so for the modern translator, when they do the translation, do they have to think of the media? Like, of the translation I'm going to do is yeah. for the textbook reader, quick reader, but not for the paper version. I haven't thought I haven't thought so much about the medium, but I have definitely thought about the audience. Mm -hmm. And I think a translation definitely has to be geared at a particular audience. You have to translate differently for different audiences. In fact, I think that's one of the most important things before you can start your translation. Okay, so I think this might be a good place to stop, and then tomorrow afternoon we'll continue. Okay. I don't. Um, I thought I was going to be finished by the time of this talk, but um, I'm still working with some technical matters. I'm still converting the text to become an ebook, so it'll probably be next month or the month after. Um, if it's out by Amazon. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
to, to look for another publisher. No one is accepted by another publisher when we need it. So, yeah, that's why we're doing all this stuff. So, you would not recommend this to buy the I'd say wait for the new version because there are certain mistakes I made with that one. Um, well, one big mistake was I chose to publish it in color, and so it's really expensive. I think it's something like forty dollars. Whereas with this next one, I'm just going to publish it in black and white, and I know I'm going to have to uh, spend ten dollars. I think that'll be more worth it. But um, if you really want to read that one, um, in Google Books, I think you can get it. You can get the greater part of it for almost free. 